<laughs> hey guys, it's Drew from The Last Years. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to Peter and the book for their 100th episode. Congratulations. Uh, so happy that we got to be a small part of it and chat with you. Uh, you made us feel super at ease and at home. Uh, and we're so thankful that we got to connect with you. Uh, here's to 100 more. Hey, Peter. JD from Kicking here. Congratulations from all of us on 100 episodes of The Book of Very Bad Things. When Kicking was on the book, we had such a good time. Talking to you was like really talking to an old friend and definitely a kindred spirit. You did something that not a lot of people do, and you took the time to not only listen to our new music, but you listened to our entire back catalog and kind of got a feel for the way our band really was. That's just not something that a lot of people do. So from all of us in kicking, congratulations, and we'll see you soon. Congrats to the homie Peter on 100 episodes of the book of very, very bad things. I am Jerry from Lacing, and I personally had a blast on this podcast. I hope there's at least 100 more episodes because, you know, not only am I a participant, but I am a fan. So Peter, man, congrats. You're a solid dude. The hard work's paying off. And uh, here's to 100, if not 1,000 more. Celebratory sparkler. I really don't hey, know. Hey, this, this is counts, Esso from Catholic School. Uh, it's from coming at you from Memphis. Sister, Samantha. Uh, just uh, was tasked to say a few words about the book of very, very bad things. So and, proud of you. Um, you, have a you know, I'd be happy to, to say that uh, the interview that I did with talents. Peter. Uh, it was one of the most uh, shine bright. exhilarating Here's experiences I've ever had. I'd never felt so book. heard and supported. And I really hope that, uh, it, you know, it's my wish that everybody has a chance to feel as uh, it, that their story is as valid and their uh, their dreams and, and things are as valid and, and uh, you know, never be discouraged from doing what you want to do. Um, even when we put obstacles in our own way uh, uh, you know something has a way of looking out for us in the end uh, it ebbs and flows but just keep riding it uh, with with me and everybody else and uh, and we'll see what happens yeah uh, man God bless uh, the book of very very bad things and Peter and uh, and, and just this whole scene uh, it's, it's super phenomenal uh, anyway thanks I just really want to congratulate Peter on his 100th episode of The Book of Very Bad Things. Great interview, great podcast. You know, the encouragement that he has given independent music across the country should be celebrated. So thank you, Peter, for everything you do. Truly appreciate it. I am really looking forward to the 100th episode of Book of Very Bad Things. Uh, he does an amazing job of doing research on his interviewees. He learns as much as he can about them, listens to their catalog, reads their books, uh, gives a very in-depth interview that, that is so much like a conversation that you don't question that you, you're being interviewed. You don't sort of panic. Um, I would recommend not drinking a glass of uh, any kind of liquid with ice in it uh, if you ever do an interview on the podcast because uh, it does come through as we learned. Thanks. Pete. Hey, Hello and welcome to another edition, the 100th edition, part two of the book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I am your host, Peter, and I am still here. And tonight, we continue our discussion with author, vocalist, songwriter, Tara Van Flower of the Great Lycia, of two incredible incredible solo records and a smattering of singles under her own name. Tara's written work spans uh, a few different collections. 
we have the Violet series, the Woolrich series. We also have the Ilya series. Well, there are, I believe, two of those. Um, Black Owl. Um, my goodness, there's she is incredibly, incredibly busy. I don't know where she finds time to do all of this. Um, two incredible solo records to her name. A smattering of singles. So many novels. Um, Tara is an inspiration to me personally. On top of being one of my best friends, um, she and Mike are very near and dear to me. That's why they are the focal point of the 100th episode. And I really hope you enjoy our antics together as we do have somewhat of a, a unique chemistry with one another. I am glad you all showed up. I'm glad you're here. Please like, rate, subscribe, uh, share with your friends. And most of all, listen, enjoy. And dig it, baby. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. Episode 100 is not the end of anything. It is, if anything, a beginning. And I hope you will take this journey with me even farther. That being said, without further ado, I give to you Tara Van Flower of Lycia. On the book, A Very, Very Bad Things Podcast, Episode 100, Part 2. We're going to be taking a short break after this. A few weeks off, two, maybe three. I'm thinking two. To take care of some things at home. And, you know, just enjoy a little bit of downtime. And then we're back. I have new equipment. Show's going to sound a little bit different, a little bit better. I hope... You are ready for this journey to change. Tara Van Flower, Lycia, the book. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> fix all of this because you know I keep thinking about how like on Star Trek and like all this stuff how people kind of just live in this like truly cohabitational like whatever and then there's things like they can just take this wand and put it over your body and heal you and like all the advanced genetic fixing they could do or DNA at, at, you know, I mean, there are, we're already starting this anyway, but like, can you, maybe that all stems from alien. Well, no, no, I mean, think, who knows? think about this. Think about the fact that the true industrial, like the industrial revolution happened and, you know, like far before this, but all of the greatest leaps in technology in uh, our, not in, in our grandparents' lifetimes, even, yeah. happened directly after the Roswell incident because right after that is when computers started to make leaps and bounds. Sure. And we have made more strides technologically in the past 50 years than we have in the past 500. Sure. It's astounding. And, and so subsequently our brains aren't even equipped to deal with it. Like Where the fact you- that we can take in information and like so quickly our brains aren't even trained to do that. And I think that's why so many people are frustrated and angry because, you know, it's kind of like when you leave a fan running on full Mm -hmm. blast or an engine or whatever, eventually it kind of like runs rough and burns out. It's like, that's our brain is constantly processing. Like there's no downtime for it. Yeah. You know, we don't, we can't take downtime. Like, Especially in the United States, at least in Europe, they still get more vacation time. Like we're trained, trained monkeys over here. 
Like you can't even you you're you're made to feel guilty for taking a day off just for <laughs> fun. You know, God forbid you not you not be sick on a day that you take off, right? Or, you know, but we all have that mindset. Yeah, and you know, it seems to me that this if this truly shakes out the way uh it seems like it's going to we're all going to have to take a step back and start to take very seriously uh a guy who built an entire musical career on dick and fart jokes uh being you know Tom DeLonge from Blink 182 because he is the catalyst for this shit i know it's funny i know mike talks about that all the time that yeah. goof that goof like he he really set this ball in motion no i i got to hand it to him i respect that i may not like I, his music but <laughs> right don't you don't care about to, it. i don't even know his music like no whatever. and you you don't have to i mean no. it's 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 pretty by the numbers descendants yeah. worshiping pop punk but yeah i'll be damned if that guy isn't brilliant because yeah. him being curious i guess led to some pretty substantial well, shifts well he had an experience when he was a kid and that turned into he wrote songs about it on their first big album their first major label album called aliens exist and after a while once blink 182 had amassed a vast fortune he started asking questions and people started to take him seriously because he was asking the right questions and making yeah. alliances with the right people my our kids and you know our grandkids are going to be talking about the guy who wrote all the small things and not for his music <laughs> <laughs> it's to me it it speaks to you know how uncanny reality is now it really yeah yeah like i feel like i'm in a movie i feel like i'm in a movie Aww. and it's it's not really as funny as it feels <laughs> right now. <laughs> like the world is so small too because like you know just meeting people is so much easier. Like you know the 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 fact that when like if you had told like 15 year old me like you will have had conversations with this person this person this person and that person and whatever I would have been like, "What? No, that's not possible." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. I mean, and even stupid stuff like not stupid, but like we went to this bar last night, this tap room um called Tap Room 120. I'll give them a shout out. Mm -hmm. And because it's like a you would love this place by the way. It's like run by punks. They have punk music, they have horror stuff in there. They run old wrestling on the big screens they have cartoons on the big screen they have old like sci-fi movies going and like last night they had this podcast come in called scaredy uh, what were what they called scaredy cast another shout out so like we specifically went there that night because Brett from Andra had told us that's his friend's bar but then also I had seen that they were having this podcast and we're interested in horror and supernatural and whatever hmm. so we went last night and we really enjoyed it we had a really good time like the 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 podcast the, the people were really funny entertaining and there they are talking about like hellier that show hellier yeah which i'm like okay tim did music on that show and just like this small world thing and then i come home and i'm like i'm just going to look him up on instagram friended him having conversations with him like that shit didn't happen back in the day like you couldn't have I mean, it, access to people like that you know what i mean you would have been like oh yeah that was cool but then that's where it would have ended it did on the macro because you know as i'd said i i was pen pals with you guys way back in the day i was pen pals with yeah. trent, Re trent resner at one point in yeah. like 1990 yeah. um but it it wasn't immediate instantaneous right access i i'm not writing you letters now we just talk on the regular because right. that's, that's right. what we do um but you know what i mean like you're right it's it just it's not quite as novel you know well and, and, and then when you go ahead 
it, maybe that that's a bad way to put it, but you know, there's an, it's great because there's an ease of access, but also to a degree, maybe it doesn't make it as, I don't know, to a 15 year old mean, not maybe not as uh, grandiose. Yeah. But in, all, in all honesty, it's, it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just such a strange thing because like you have some kid that lives in the middle of nowhere who can go online and potentially talk to their favorite artist or musician or model or actor or whoever, and like become friends with that person and it could change their life. Like that's just bizarre to me and awesome. I mean, and like you, I had like, that's how I met Jarbo. I wrote her a fan letter. I mean, that's how I met Mike, mm -hmm. you know, and we, she just wrote me back. I continued to write her. And then as I got into music more, like we became friends, blah, blah, blah. But like, it, it's just such a bizarre, like instantaneous, like I, I still get like, oh my God, look, when you'll write a comment on some actor on their Instagram or whatever, and they'll like it. And I'm still like, oh my God, they liked it. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, it's such a cool thing. But then on the flip side of that, I think it's caused people to sort of also be a-holes because they're like, well, you're not a real, you're a real person. The mystique is kind of gone and I'm going to tell you how stupid you are. And I don't know. You know what though? I think <laughs> for as damaging as that is, and especially to young people, that's very damaging. Um, yeah. With the trolling and all that shit. Yeah. I get, I get tons of trolls, tons. Uh, it doesn't bother me because oh, a, I, I came from a different school completely than the, the young people of today. Yeah. Uh, I, I was a, I was a, a basically an amateur pugilist uh, up in these streets. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was in fistfights constantly growing up. Uh, words are not going to hurt me. I was raised by a Vietnam veteran. Like, yeah. Right, what right. are you going to do? What are you going to well, do? Well, and back in the day, like we really were hardcore bullied. So yeah. yes, like, we were. And and I just don't even want to deal with it. That's why, like, on my YouTube stuff, I turned all the comments off. I'm like, you know. Most people are positive, but I don't even want to see, like, I'd rather not see a hundred good comments to avoid the one bad one. Like, that's just how my brain works. Like, I don't even want to look at it. And mm -hmm. so I'm like super quick to cut people off now. I hate it. And I don't like, I don't like that because I, I don't like dismissing people, I guess. But I also right. don't want it in my life because all I do is sit around and stress out about it. And so I just cut people off now. But it's just, I don't like that you even have to go through that process. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I mean, I, I, I get a kick out of it occasionally when people will try to troll me because I get to sharpen my skills of destroying people with sure. my rhetoric, which, sure. is, which is a ton of fun. But yeah. in the same token... I think to myself, like these people, these trolls, they're sitting there and they're, they're picking at you, but also like you see this person constantly popping up as a, like a listener of my podcast. Right. They're, they're, this is a weekly listener, but they're right. giving me shit. So maybe they're just looking for someone, or some kind of, yeah, 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 some kind of connection, some validation. So I, there's better it, ways. <laughs> there's better ways certainly but uh, i forget what episode the person was talking about but they were like yeah wh why don't you why don't you uh you know advertise yourself a little bit more at the beginning of episodes and i i immediately wrote right back in real time i was like how the fuck do you expect me to get any kind of advertisement if i don't advertise myself if no one's listening to this i'm throwing shit at a wall for no reason i right. have to i have to do this yeah. It's the name of the game. What right. else would you what else would you have me do? Right. And then I saw typing, stop. Typing, stop. Typing, stop. Then you're right. I'm sorry. The end. <laughs> That's shocking. That's yeah. shocking. Yeah. Literally shocking because most people dig their heels in instead of saying, You're right. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I paraphrased. I was probably a bit sure. strong, stronger in sure. uh, you sure. know my verbiage, but you know, really, that's that's the best you got. Yeah. It feels like, like for me, it depends on what day someone hits me. If you hit me on the right day, I'll just ignore it. Mm -hmm. Hit me on the wrong day. I'm not a nice person. <laughs> I have to work at being a nice person. Not really. Kind of, but not really. I sort have of. to, I have to work at being a nice person sometimes. I don't have to work as hard at it now as I used to have to work at it. Now I just kind of, seethe inside mm -hmm. and let it go or hold on to it, but don't tell anybody about it. But, um, yeah, I don't usually put up with stuff. I, in real life, I'm worse, sadly, uh, <laughs> especially in the workplace being that I, I, mm -hmm. I work with primarily men in a construction type field, uh, older. I work with a lot of older men who are definitely Trumpers. And whenever they like to get mouthy, they like to yell. And one of those old men tried to yell at me on this past Thursday, and uh, he turned he turned a, a a lighter shade of pale to quote a song. He, he, he uh, fucked around and found out. He, fu he <laughs> fucked around and consequently found out because I was like within millimeters of his face, just allowing him. I love uh, to see that. Oh, I get. That's satisfying. I get scary though. I mean, my boss has even told me, like, I've seen you lose your temper. You scare me. I said, Good, I should scare you. And that's how that usually well, How about don't push me that far then? Yeah, don't, just stay out of my face. It's easy. It's really easy. Yeah. But I do I I do need to kind of tone it down because it's not the nineties anymore. And okay. you know, I can't necessarily get into a fist fight on a job site now and you know, retain employment. <laughs> I'm grateful that it doesn't usually like I, I I'm super grateful that I don't normally get that worked up about things, to be honest with you. But um you know, it took a lot of biting my tongue because I very much can be like a pit bull and latch on to things. With but me, I mean it's it's wait, going back to that. About other people though. It's like I'm defending somebody else. It's never like for me, I'm like, yeah, abuse me, whatever. I don't give a fuck, but we'll do it to somebody else. And that's what triggers me. But anyway, mm -hmm. with me, it goes, it goes back to like, it's a call back to earlier conversation here, the toxic masculinity that I was, you know, raised with as most of us in our age group were raised with. My dad was a very toxic male. You know, I was yeah. the, I was reared in that. So how do you express masculinity and dominance in a situation with other men? You speak that language. I'm not proud yeah. of it. I'm not proud of it at all. And that little boy in the room next is not going to learn that from me. Yeah. He's never going to see that sure. side of me. Yeah. He's, he barely hears me yell. I, I, yeah. I'm, just, right. I'm, a, I'm a soft touch at home, but yeah. fuck, fuck with me outside of this house and it's a whole right. different... <laughs> I'm still yeah. that dude. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I, I There's a, that part of me that ab abhors violence. Yeah. But there's also that part of me that once I'm there, once I've reached that seeing red yeah. level, I, have, right. I don't have a stop button. I don't have, there's no right. pause. I just go. And I don't like that. I don't That's like feeling like hard. that. Yeah, it's it's an awful feeling. It it is it's like you know, I have that Aries quick temper, but I also control it. And it's usually more self-directed than anywhere else. Mm. And but if you've pushed me that far to be angry like that, then I'm just done with you. Like I have why would I want that? Like, if you've made me so angry that I can't control myself, it's on you because I'm, I will take it and take it and take it. And then it's like that one step too far and it's done, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I think, well, thankfully this does not happen very often, but once in a, once in a while, someone will just 
it, it just happened. Actually, it, it just happened last week. You know how I, I feel like we've talked about this before. There's people that they only ever say something snarky or sarcastic or something negative. They never interact with you online where it's positive. It's always like they're making a smart ass comment. They're being negative. They're critical. Everything's negative, 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 negative. And finally, this one person kept doing it and doing it. And I, I'll be I remember honest, this. I didn't even like him. First of all, this is an awful thing to say, but I didn't really like him anyways, based on things from back in the day. But I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm a very capable of letting things go. As evidenced by the fact that Dave and I have a great relationship. I was friends with ex-boyfriends who were horrible to me. Mm-hmm. I let things go. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. If you're cool, you're cool. It's good. We're good. But the just constant nitpicking. Finally, I was like, I'm done with this. Like, I don't need this. Why, why am I putting up with this petty tyrant in my life? And so I, I just like ended up <laughs> like block, done, <laughs> not dealing with this anymore. And it felt good. It felt real good. You know, but the, I, I don't like the, to do that though. But there's something satisfying about uh, not blowing up, not not uh, you know getting worked up about it. Just poof, be gone. There, there's something very powerful about that because you know that person is looking for that. They that's clearly the, the, the reaction that they require in order to feel uh, anything. Yeah, like they need that sort of interaction that that negativity yeah. because uh they weren't hugged enough or you know their dad smacked an ice cream cone out of their hand or some shit right to just disappear that's a beautiful thing that's a powerful it thing it's like why are we continuing with the sparse you clearly don't like me or you would do more than just be negative mm. what is this stupidity like what is this retarded idiotic relationship you know and anyway it's over but (laughs) (laughs) but i don't like doing it because like you know like i said i'm long suffering that's why i don't say anything and ignore it ignore it or i'll give it back to you or whatever but then it comes to a point where you're just like nope not doing this anymore Uh, that's and that's that's healthier than the way i deal with things i can tell you that well, so what did you glean from uh, watching the congressional hearings? Because uh, I'm the one thing I have uh, not a piss taking about, but I'm a little disappointed about is the focal point of the whole thing were, you know, three people that at one point or another have already been vocal about this thing. Uh, I know in the future that the one gentleman dropped names and phone numbers of people who can corroborate things in are probably not going to want to speak out, but they're going to be subpoenaed. I'm, I'm really bummed that that's all they had at this time. And they, they spent that much time on, on such, so few witnesses when they could have really, you know, pulled out all the stops. That was my, my one, my one piss taking with it. So I'm not that far into it because I turned it on mid afternoon today as I was working. And then of course you get distracted by having to stop it and pay attention to what you're doing. And you know, dirt coming in and ask me a question, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't get that far into day one, mm-hmm. but out of the gate, I think the thing that made me literally drop my jaw was, I don't know, I drop my jaw. Mm-hmm. That's weird. Um, was the football sized football field sized ship. And I literally was like, how are they talking about all of this stuff? And nobody's freaked out. I mean, and, and like the, uh, the other part where the guy was talking about the, the Tic Tac video, but there was also something in the ocean, in the water. Yeah. And I'm like, I I said to Mike, because he was out here too, and I'm like, it's not like they're talking to some like weird random Yahoo off the street. Like, these guys aren't gonna 
do this in front of Congress and lie about it because there's repercussions for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and and so that I think that's kind of what blows my mind is that they're so blatantly talking about stuff that previously was like stuff you'd listen to on Art Bell and just be like, well, maybe this person's telling the truth. Maybe they're not telling the truth. Or, you know, stuff you watch on Ancient Aliens or, you know, whatever. And I'm like, no, these guys are literally testifying in front of Congress. They could get in big trouble, you know, and then they start talking about the threats on their lives and all. And I'm just, you know, that's what's gotten me so far. But so I'm not far enough into it to have gotten to the frustrating part that you're talking about yet. I will say that I get a little irritated when certain members of Congress start throwing up about stuff like the Biden administration and the Chinese balloon. And I'm just like, can we just not like, can oh, we just look, not do that right now? Well, the, uh, the Republican that spearheaded this whole thing, who he's, he's very cool for having done this, but right. He would make these like comments out of the side of his head about like, well, I, I'm talking about the Tic Tac video, not the communist app TikTok. Oh well, yeah, stuff like that. Like, I, that dude, was irritating too. Put that shit away. Like, I know. We're, we're not I here know. for your fucked up politics. We're here for the truth, not your goof. Yeah, up we don't want to. We don't care about that. Like you said, it was supposed to be bipartisan. Leave it bipartisan. Stop with that mm-hmm. horse shit crap. Another yeah. thing, though, I did think was funny is Andy Biggs, who's our congressman or whatever i can't mm-hmm. obviously i can't stand him first yeah, he of all he should probably be in jail mm-hmm. let's just call it what it is but anyway um i loved the fact that he brought up the phoenix lights and was like where can i get the report on this and the guy's like well i can tell you privately i can't yeah i'm like that w- i thought that was pretty cool Consi- you know we live here and everything and like the phoenix lights was such a huge thing and at the time like all the crap that that you know the governor came out with an alien costume and like all that crap that happened and then of course down the line he was like yeah i saw it too <laughs> you know yeah. but so that was kind of cool i liked that and i'm like boy can you imagine if we found out like if we really did like because they're all talking about like we need to release this information so that everybody knows I'm like that's awesome can you imagine finally getting answers but also on the flip side of that that might be terrifying yeah well here's the thing where where you guys are right now is a part of like a, a ufo cluster hot like a hot spot sure. yeah sedona is a hot spot um tempe is a hot spot they're they're all dotted all along the desert it's just yeah. and it's active as hell uh on the flip side here in the northeast the like the site of the largest north american uh ufo crash is about what five miles six miles from my house that's amazing like it, it, things are ramping up and this isn't just you know m- me talking about my normal like ooh, 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 spooky stuff yeah. This this is stuff that like it's been on. Uh, oh God, Jeremy Corbell. I don't uh, know that name. He's uh, he's basically the preeminent uh, ufologist right now. Okay. He was at he was at those hearings. You can see him in in, in the oh, crowd, okay. in the background. Okay. Um, he's involved with Tom DeLonge from Blink One Eighty Two. Okay. He's involved with a ton of people. He was here. For, to see that crash and, and the scientist that he had with him who was taking uh, Geiger counter readings and picking up all this radiation ended up with radiation burns on his arms from getting too close to this crash site. Oh, okay. And, okay. They, and they said this, this was the, the most uh, authentic and, you know, most massive crash site that they'd ever seen. Uh, I, what I want to know is, where are all the, where's the shrapnel? Where are the, the, the bits and pieces? Uh, why are we just getting, you know, bro- like scorched earth and radiation? Where, like, where did it all go? Like, I, I can tell you where, because the army depot is right there. <laughs> yeah. But like, these are the things like when we start to find out 
about the truth about all of this, the shocking part's not going to be the aliens or, or their intentions. It's going to be how far our own government that we subsidize went to keep it from our sight. That's the part that's going to blow everybody's mind. They're you know, finally figure out you can't trust these fucking people. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, like, do you remember? You remember the TV show V, that miniseries? Yeah, of course. Back in the, day? the Star and Child. I, <laughs> <laughs> I often think about this because, like, one day life. I mean, it's, this has happened in a million sci-fi films. One day life is like normal. And the next day, the ships show up, and everything is changed forever. I mean, War of the Worlds, like all these, you know, movies that we've had all these decades. Like that's literally going to happen at some point. Yeah. Like life is going to be normal, but it's going to be this theoretical alien thing, and then they're going to be here, like for real, for real. Even mm -hmm. though I'm sure they already are. Yeah. But like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we've had experiences. Last winter, I know without a shadow of a doubt, we saw a UFO. There mm -hmm. was there's zero explanation otherwise. And I talked to MUFON about it. They did their research or you know, research and stuff, and they're like, there's nothing that that could have been. So it's I unidentified. Mm -hmm. I have no explanation for that. You know, I won't speak for other people and what they saw, but like, likewise, no explanation for that. And I'm like, so it's been a real thing. I mean, first of all, I always kind of, you know, you believe in it, but there's yeah. never been any hard evidence. But when you see something refute it anymore you know you can't it's not a it's not a theoretical anymore it's a what it was i don't know i don't know i don't know what it was i know it's not anything normal and then i start thinking mike and i were talking about this the other day and i i'm like think of how frustrating it is for people when they have these experiences that are real and then someone comes along and tells them no that wasn't real like that didn't really happen. That was something else. You imagined it. It was birds. It was, you know, whatever. Even to the supernatural stuff, which is what we normally talk about, yeah. where you feel the hand on you, you feel it like plain as day, or you see the thing or you hear the thing or whatever. And then someone's telling you, no, that was your imagination. Like, bitch, I felt the hand on my arm. That wasn't my imagination. <laughs> I'm not on drugs. <laughs> you know. My favorite part of that is the people who say that shit are usually like militantly Christian. So you believe that, right. you know, a beast with seven heads and ten coronets on each head came right. from the lake. And, right, you know, right. like all of the, all of the, like, obviously, hyper realistic supernatural things that transpire in the body of the bible right you buy, you buy that because right. it, ha it happened back then was is there like a premium on when right. strange right. shit can happen only in the time of you know the right. the old testament up to the the death and resurrection of christ and right. then it's null and it's void. Everything stopped. got mad yeah. normal after that. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's just all stopped. Right. That's ridiculous. And my question to that would be, do you really believe that? Because if you really believe that, then you should also al allow for other people to have their experiences. Yeah. You know. And, and, you know, big surprise, Christian Pete here does not, I, I think most of the Bible's allegory. I'm sorry. I, I it's an allegory. It's a, it's um, called metaphor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, especially the Old Testament. That's just like that's a that's a. It, basically, they they didn't have uh, you know movies back then. There was no cinema right. to go to. Right. How and so there's no Star Wars to see. So you can't glean right. uh, you know your morals from a movie. So you're gonna have to have it out of a book. Um, yeah, 
I always yeah. just felt, you know, even like we were talking earlier about the whole creation versus evolution thing. I always felt like creation is sort of the poetic, beautiful description and uh, of creation and evolution is the scientific like they're the same thing they're just one of it is written artistically one of it is written like math yeah That's all it is yeah you know I mean, it's not that complicated to figure out i still have people like like very like very 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 close to me who will argue me into the ground we didn't come from monkeys we didn't come from monkeys. I don't know. Yeah. I can't believe you believe we came from monkeys. It's like, well, we did or we didn't. I wasn't there, but the probability is there. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, considering you can see, I mean, even even evolution in dogs. Yeah. And that's a short period of time that you can see how dogs evolved from, like, it's not that complicated. Well, the, and why, the, why are you such a snob that you, what, Adam and Eve as, a, as more ape-like isn't good enough for you? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how, why are you such a snob? Well, he, here's the thing. Uh, the argument I always get back is, if we came from monkeys, why, why, if we came from great apes, because that's what we did come from, sure. why, why are there still great apes and monkeys? Because they didn't have to go any further they were perfect as they were yeah the, we came from uh, supposedly australiopolithecus that is the 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 primate that became human mm -hmm. they were water monkeys or water apes they were apes that were they semi-aquatic they liked to swim they did stuff that most great apes didn't do uh they had to get better at fishing. They had to get better at everything because they were in places that were flooding out. Um, they just, they were forced to evolve. Time goes on, time goes on. Walking upright became us. We got worse. Let's face facts. I mean, we created art and literature and music and all these beautiful things, but we also created the the pickle that we're in with our planet right now right so maybe we went a little too far but that's you know, where the aliens come in that's where the aliens come in <laughs> i do have an alternate theory on on us coming from australia polythicus too uh maybe it is more like that ridley scott alien uh sequel where you know, the, the, the big whacked out looking goth looking bald alien comes out and opens up a pot and sparks life onto the planet. Uh, it could have gone down like that too. Sure. Sure. But that's not sexy. Right. I, I'd rather, I would rather the Bible. <laughs> I mean, what's that? What is the, um, ah. oh my God. The movie with James Spader with the gate. And it's like ancient Stargate. Egypt. Stargate. Stargate. Maybe it's yeah. like more like Stargate, you know? I don't know. Because that's pretty sexy. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and I'm surprised that you mentioned James Spader before Kurt Russell. That's that's, that's interesting. Well, maybe that's how my brain works. Well, I guess because his character maybe is more I identify more with him in that movie than I do well, Kurt Russell. Well, he, he was the intellectual. Kurt Russell was the soldier. Yeah. Um, that's Program. a great film. We just a, recent, we watched it about a year ago. It, that's a, again we've seen it before, but yeah, that's a good film. They uh, they they missed the mark with the sequels. They should have spent more money. And even though there were any, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, there was a series, Stargate Atlantis, and then Stargate SG. Something. Oh, the TV show. Yeah. The TV show. Okay, yeah, I didn't watch any of those. There was the Wait, there wasn't were, Jason Momoa on one of those? Yeah. Okay, yeah. maybe I should when revisit he, that. <laughs> <laughs> Every woman I know is Jason Momoa. Oh man, that guy. But uh you know I I you could get into a wormhole with it, but at the end of the day, if we were to really be handed the truth, ninety percent of us wouldn't buy it anyway.
I agree. Yeah, we're, that's we're true. So, I mean, we people. I mean, for God's sake, even stupid shit over medicine. People are like, that's gonna corrupt my. You know, whatever. We don't need to go down that road again. But like, people, you could hand them a math problem that is factually sound as proof of something, and they still fake news. Like, this is just a distraction. A distraction from what? Like, what do you... Just shut up. How is it a distraction when it doesn't even come up in the top 20... Exactly. Uh, ...things in, in my news feed? And, I mean, you know what I'm into. This should be number one in my news feed. This should be the yeah. thing that shows up. But what's showing up is uh, new charges against Trump. Uh... Putin and uh, you know the summit for uh, grain because he's trying to you know stop the dissemination of grain from the Ukraine. Uh, everything else, everything else. There was stuff about Kim fucking Kardashian, but right. nothing about these hearings. Yeah. The only well, reason I didn't even I, know about it. Oh, I, I'm the, I told you about it, and yeah. the only reason I knew is because I follow that that Corbell gentleman. Yeah. Who, who's all tied in with the Gaia TV network and, and Tom DeLong and to the yeah. stars incorporated and everything. So I was well abreast that this was going to uh, occur. Otherwise, had I been relying upon what Apple news decides to populate into my yeah. news feed, right. I, I'd have been fucked. I, I wouldn't have known yeah. for months. Yeah. Well, and Dirk Hitch said, there's people on TikTok talking about aliens and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, whatever, TikTok. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, don't believe everything you see. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but he had sent me um, a video of some kid talking about it and then followed up with a video that was like an official announcement about it. And then like within a short amount of time, you said did you see what you did you see the thing yesterday and i'm like no what are you talking about because i'd already forgotten all about it mm. and then and then you sent me that link but yeah a, i'm telling you there's a there's a very uh very deliberate reason why it doesn't get populated into everything and that's because it's not a distraction what we see on a daily basis like about the you know stuff going on with donald trump for mm -hmm. example, uh, let's face it. He's never going to be put in jail. He's never going to be found guilty. They're going to let him slide. Not because he was a good politician, not because he's even a politician or anything of that sort. He's got money. He's, he's got the complexion. He's got everything on his side yeah. to get away with murder. You yeah, know? and they're probably terrified of what would happen if he actually did co get convicted, you know? Yeah, yeah. January 6th, part duh. You know? Yeah. I actually already, I saw a headline where the Secret Service and um, somebody else had actually had to have a meeting about that because they're already making plans about what, what's going to happen when, when it, whatever goes down, goes down. But... Yeah, because they just brought new charges against them because they right. found more evidence. They could find evidence, and, you know, that whack job said it on national television. I could walk down, you know, Broadway or whatever in New York City and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't even get arrested. Yeah. And he's fucking right. Yeah. I still have to be the eternal optimist and hope that, and I don't care what side they're on. If you're doing this stuff, you need to be held accountable for it. I don't care what political party you belong to. You know, yeah. it's not right. And you should be held accountable for it. But we know how that goes. Yeah, sadly, I do. Um, on a kind of lighter note, <laughs> there's, there's a... Uh, Hallmarks of Great Awakening written all over this because in all of these times of, of like ultimate strife of, of division in the country, something phenomenal always seems to follow that. 
I hope so. You know what I'm saying? The Vietnam, I hope so. the Vietnam War bore the fruit of civil rights across, like the 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 dissolution of Jim Crow and and civil rights being you know a focal point in in the nation. Uh, great music came of it, just as it did after World War II, after World War One. All these times of intense strife in 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 the world are followed by a, a time of enlightenment. So that tells me that after having, you know, kind of survived Trump and and <laughs> and the uh, the disappointment of of what I thought the presidency of of Obama would have been because I I hung so much hope on that man. And and ultimately, he sadly got corrupted, like every president does. And we should never ever edify a president because they're just men. And once you get ultimate power, you're corrupted ultimately. But after all of this shit, after you know, basically witnessing the death of thousands of of, of uh, species of creatures and and fossil fuels corrupting the earth. And, and the worst person to ever have considered becoming president, becoming president. Now we're finding out the truth that we've all been suspicious of about, about you know, life on other planets and, and, and us having UFOs around. And something good's got to come. I, I, that, that, that little optimist that, that takes up maybe like a, a two hundredth of, of who I am has to believe that something great is on the other side of this. I hope so. I know there's been more than one occasion where I've prayed, just please let them come. <laughs> <laughs> like let them be truly, you know, for our best interests. You know, they always, there's always that conspiracy that, um, you know, they've laid back and like watched us and like let us do our thing for so long. And then finally they're just like, yeah, they're not going to get this right. We're going to have to go fix it for them. But no, well, I mean, there's also that, that whole school of thought where once we detonated the, when the first atomic bomb, when we were testing it, when Oppenheimer was testing it, that was like a, a beacon to other beings because like, when an atomic bomb goes off, there's an electromagnetic pulse that's so powerful that it shuts down electronics and everything within miles. It also sends out a signal that, you know, will reverberate through space. If there is something bad on the way, guess what, guys? We invited them. Well, it's kind of like the, the end of um, uh, the one, I guess it was Batman versus Superman. When Superman dies... Mm -hmm. And Lex Luthor says the bell has been rung. Yeah. And yeah. that whole thing reverberated out to dark side. And he, came, it's kind of like that, like this energy pulse goes out into the, into the, you know, ether. And it's kind of like everybody that can hear it goes, what was that? <laughs> oh, let's go, let's figure that out. <laughs> wow. Oh, and that's creepy. Yeah, it is creepy. And and speaking of that, like, there, it's a very contentious thing, the whole Snyderverse thing. But uh, <laughs> my God, I hate you know I I hated Batman versus Superman until the Snyder cut came about. I I really I went to see it. I didn't love it. And that, like for years, you know, I was my brother was like, Oh, but he's such a good Bruce Wayne. And I'm like, Yeah, fuck him, fuck that movie, <laughs> fuck all of it. And then I have to eat my words because not only does the Snyder cut of, of Batman vs. Superman, but the Justice League they, they dropped the same day on HBO. I called off work the next day because I stayed <laughs> up all night watching this stuff and I'm glued to it, like riveted. I know. In a very, very intense way. I had such a visceral reaction to his like like vision of this that I fell in love with Ben Affleck and I always kinda hated his ass. Oh yeah, same. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And and it, now I'm going back and seeing his other movies and being like, you know, no, he's good. He's really good. What was I mad about? I shouldn't have been mad at him. It's not his fault that I'm a dick. Yeah, right. I, I hated... Uh, the reason why I hated him, truly, is because when I still had hair, I had the same haircut, that pompadour, because I was a rockabilly-looking dude uh, back in the day, as you probably remember, because that's what I looked like the first time you ever laid eyes on me. But my mom used to always tell me since he started, he was in Goodwill Hunting. He reminds me of you. Oh, that's funny. Oh, God. Uh, like, I, I hated him and I hated... Uh, Oh God, the the guy from the Mummy and he's now in the movie The Whale. Oh, uh, Brand, Brandon Fraser. Brandon Fraser. I can't I, see that movie, by the way. The Whale. I want to watch it because I know it's going to be good, but I know it's going to gut me. I know it's going to gut me. It gutted me. I I cried like a baby. I I stood in my kitchen with a belly full of wine, watching it on my phone, crying, yeah. crying. But when I was uh in my early like teen late teens early 20s i grappled with my mom with ben affleck because he was <laughs> first starting to, to to happen all of the women that i knew and and brendan frazier and then then like like a little bit before that when leonardo dicaprio was on growing pains he and i had the same haircut that, that's that funny floppy blonde <laughs> thing going yeah. you look just like this my whole life, I've looked like someone to somebody. Right. Just not me. Right. <laughs> like, fuck you. Fuck him and fuck you. <laughs> it's so funny with the Ben Affleck as Batman. So I was like a massive Christian Bale oh, fan in general. The and best. then this is Batman. So good, right? The best. And so when they announced that Ben Affleck was, ba- was going to be Batman, I was like, what? That's dumb. Like, no, no, no. But then I'm like, okay, I'm going to step back. I'm going to follow my own advice and not have an opinion about it until I've seen it. Cause I'm like, why would they hire someone that can't do the job? Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I loved Batman versus Superman. Like, and I was like, he's my favorite Batman now. Like I, he was so like giant. Yeah. Physically. And just the stoicism. I don't know. I just, he was so conflicted. He was so yeah, like, like he, he was like real, like yeah. you, you know, when but he, like Mike and I both love that movie. Like that's one of my favorite movies. It's one and of then, my favorite too. Yeah. It's so good. And then when the justice league movie came out and it was the Joss Whedon version. Yeah. We left the theater and like, it was just this disappointment because Batman versus Superman have been so great. And then this movie, I'm like, there's all this goofy shit in it and, and whatever. And so when people started rallying to get the Snyder cut, of course I was on board with that. And then we watched that and just blown away at how good it is. But now it's so depressing because we're never going to get the full story that he had for the vision. I mean, he had it all mapped out. That's why it was slow. Because yeah. it was going to take time to develop the whole story, and the people, the stuff that people had cr- had criticized it about, it's like, yeah, but it's going to pay off in the end. Yeah, but we'll never get it now. So I disagree, and here's why: Have you seen the Flash yet? Yeah, very good. Very fucking good. Yeah, so so good that it's reestablishing uh, 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 the already massive interest. And Zach doing uh, uh, the rest of. Well, I hope you're right that. because I want it. <laughs> well, Mr. Gunn is not a stupid man and he's going to know a good payday when he sees one. Um, I'm not one of these people who's going to shit on him because I've yeah, been following sure. him since he was making trauma films. Okay. Yeah. He made some great. Slither's a great movie. Slither's an excellent <laughs> horror movie. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy, the whole trilogy, fucking great. Love mm-hmm. them. Yeah. He's not stupid. Once the story arc with Robert Pattinson doing Batman, which I think is very, very good. Oh, yeah. Very, very good. It's yeah. very good. It's Taxi Driver. 
Him and he, he's my him and Ben Affleck for Batman for me are like right here. And Christian Bale's just kind of like right there now. <laughs> Christian, yeah, but uh, you, I'm sorry. The story, as far as just story, yeah, it's good. Christopher Nolan making Batman that trilogy. You're yeah. never, you're never going to put a patina on that. It's always going to have its own shine. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's just they're different Batman movies. And you know what? I I also am a firm believer in you don't have to make things a competition. Like let no. it be its own thing. That's its own thing. That's its own thing. Michael Keaton as Batman is a he's a he's a juggernaut. He's incredible. I love Michael Keaton. I love him as Batman. It was fun to see him in Flash. Oh, I loved it. I lo I loved seeing re seeing the realization of Nicolas Cage as Superman too. That, that was wild. Very happy. Very oh my happy. god, that was so wild. Yeah, that was even, wild. Even though it was AI, it was still really cool. Yeah. But you know that the whole Flashpoint uh story arc in the comic books was a big favorite of mine back in mm -hmm. the day. I loved it so much uh, as a DC fanatic. I'm not I was never a big Marvel guy. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy the movies now for what they are. Yeah. I, I didn't read those comic books, not, not, not religiously, uh, maybe peripherally when my friends would hand them over to me because everybody else loved Marvel. I was a vertigo and DC guy. Yeah. Um, I, I voraciously absorbed the flashpoint series and, and all that it withheld. They need to just let Zach finish it up. I hope so. I hope so. This was an interesting thing to me. So when they announced that Henry Cavill was not going to be Superman anymore, and people were freaking the fuck out about it, justifiably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting that James Gunn did he, this. He worded it something like, "Henry's not going to be the Superman now." Yeah. Now that word, like the way he worded it put a light bulb in my head because I had also heard rumors that they were going to go down the kingdom come route. Yeah. And if you go that route, Superman's an old man at that point. All yep. the heroes are old. So you could bring all those actors back down the line. So I'm like, maybe he's setting up like, and the kid that they hired to play Superman looks, looks exactly like, like Henry Cavill. Just like him. And I'm like, maybe what he's doing is the long game in that this kid's going to be Superman now. And then 10 years down the line, they jump forward to do Kingdom Come and they bring back Cavill. And because he, that's another thing that's weird is, first of all, Henry Cavill's smart to keep his mouth shut. Yeah. But like the fact that he hasn't really said anything about it and none of the other actors have said anything about it either. Like that's suspicious to me. Yep. That they know no, no. More, they know more than they're letting on. And you know, speaking of, of, of Henry Cavill and the the Man of Steel, that's the best Superman movie. Like hands it's really down. Good. yeah, it's really good. There's like people like Marvel is obviously they're the Disney IP now. Uh they've been Stan Lee is completely just erased out of it or whatever. Uh, but DC always had the better characters, the darker, the, the more grid, the more gritty, uh, just phenomenal storytelling. Detective comics is the best comic book company hands down, but I've, I've loved Christopher Reeve my whole life. As, yeah, as, as Superman. That was another thing. Seeing him in the Flash. Oh my God! I yeah. literally had like I started I, crying just so seeing. So did him. I. So did I. Oh, my but, heart. But Henry Cavill. Oh, please. What the? He fuck? embodies it. Like he embodies Superman. Like completely. Like he was born to play that. He was born to play that. But he was also born to play the you know the Witcher. The Witcher. <laughs> yeah. Which is over now. This season, right? This Who is, is the his end. new? What is his next thing that he's doing? Not sure. He got it. Something got recent. Uh, oh, uh, Warhammer. Was it Warhammer he's doing? That might be it. I think I'm, so. He's I'm, producing, I think, for, for Amazon, right? Amazon, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Warhammer. 
I, I would know. watch him just stand there, to be quite honest with you. Well, he, he's he's a pretty man. <laughs> I, he just is. Like the TV show of him just sitting there. Eh, I'd watch that. They should probably just make a, a TV series of, of, of him and uh, Aquaman. Whatever. And Momoa. Jason, just standing there being like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like sitting around drinking beer and like eating steak or something. I watch that. Yeah, yeah, just being dudes, dude. <laughs> now, I, I I watched recently. Uh, uh, I don't know where it's from. Probably just from his personal YouTube or whatever. The guy uh, from What We Do in Shadows, the original mm -hmm. one. He was the he was the uh, the dandy. Of, of the group. Okay. Yeah, He's yeah, a, yeah. He directs now. He directs a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. He and Jason Momoa were at a bar together, just broing out, doing whatever, drinking. Uh, this Kiwi and, and Jason Momoa as this hulking mass of, of beautiful man. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and he's talking about how he always wanted to have this one Nikon camera or what have you. Like it was, it was his holy grail of, of physical, like, you know, yeah. Reg regular film cameras. And Jason Momoa just pulls it out and says, you know, I had this, I bought this brand new for, and, 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 you know, I, I love this, but it's, it's for you. And the dude just has this really visceral uh, reaction to him, just giving away this like $5,000 camera to him out of friendship. It's just like, I, I usually hate these people because I'm a class warrior. You know what I mean? I, I'm thinking like, you know, fuck you because you've got the money. But I don't know. There's something about it that felt very authentically not bullshit about it. Well, and it's not like he came from money. I mean, he was a poor no. kid. So yeah. that I feel like it's different when it's like somebody who clogged themselves up and like, that's not the same thing as someone who's born with a silver spoon in their mouth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it, this was surprising to me, too. Randomly, um, I came across this YouTube thing, and it was, like, eating so-and-so, eating their last meal, and it and it it was Post Malone. And I'm like, I don't know anything about Post Malone. What I, I mean, he, I know who he I is. I met him. I met him. He's a great dude. That's what, I'm, that's what I was going to say. Like, it's this, uh, this YouTube channel, and they'll, like, eat someone's last meal, and the guy prepares it for him, and, like, he's a chef and all this stuff. And just the way he talked about life and like his viewpoint on things and like how he treats people and why he treats people that I'm like, that guy is awesome. Yeah. Post like, Malone, he seems like a legit, sweet, kind hearted person. He came from hardcore bands. He came from the same scene as, as, as us with the punk rock and everything. You yeah. know what I mean? He, I remember his old bands cause I'd seen one of his old bands. Uh, but that's insane. Sadly, my favorite story about him doesn't include me. Uh, I only met him at shows, just like, hey, man, great set. He was fucking yeah. really as like you see the videos of him like talking to his fans and being really loving with them. That, yeah. was, that was him then, but it was easier then. The yeah. fact that he still does it now is really big. But it just so happens that one of my coworkers, their, his grandmother, owns a, a home next to his summer home, which is in like Rhode Island or something. Mm -hmm. Countless videos of Post Malone and, and her, like his, his grandmother, like hanging out constantly oh. like on the beach. Uh, and uh, the one video, and they're not on YouTube or anything because they're personal things, but she's sure. like, they're hanging out on the beach and she's like, well, we're going to have some friends over and you know, we're, we're, having some crawfish and shrimp and stuff. Do you want to come? And he's like, yeah, yes, I want to come. And <laughs> he shows cool. up at their house. Like he's a, he's a real dude. He's a real person. Yeah. He seems very legit. And so like when somebody like that becomes mega wealthy, I'm like, good for you, brother. Like I would love to be in your shoes right now. But so I don't put them on the same thing as like a Donald Trump where you're born with, you know, never having to worry a day in your damn life and being bailed out constantly. And by the way, uh, newsflash, an alien has just appeared in our home. Uh oh. So we're about to reveal something. Oh my goodness. <laughs> They're made this mask. Take it, like show it to them. 
He made this mask. Yeah. Isn't it cool? Oh, you know what it looks like to me a little bit? Do you remember uh, the slee stacks? Yes, it does look like a slee stack. Huh? It yeah, totally it totally looks like tongue. <laughs> the tongue sticking out. Every, it looks like a, yeah. it looks like a slee stack, like straight oh, up. That is. Yeah, he took this. You know the Jurassic Park masks, like kids masks. Yeah. But he bought one and then hand painted all of it and like glued all this fur and like remade the straps on it. The and straps like literally hurt before. Yeah, because it's for a kid, like a littler kid. Yeah. So he had to remake the straps for it to fit on his bigger kid body. But yeah, he's uh he's always creating these costumes and props and stuff. Turk, is that a is that a Velociraptor mask originally? It, it wasn't a Velociraptor. It was just one of the Jurassic yeah world ones that are only like fifteen dollars. So yeah, I don't know what dinosaur it was. I can't I remember. remember. It was just one. But, yeah, he completely repainted it. I think Dad's asking for me. I think he just said, "Where are you, bro?" Okay, I I, I need to go. <laughs> He's getting suited back up. <laughs> he's super creative that's so awesome i mean how can he not be coming from the both of you but it's yeah. it's it's great that he's delivering on that and and he's creating music now or at least taking music lessons doing music theory yeah. all of that for sure that's going to kind of give the both of you like yet another life in music yeah. Um, not not to say that you're going to be like the dark partridge family or whatever, but <laughs> I would love that. I would I would secretly <laughs> love that. They're like No, like I have I definitely have had we've definitely had conversations of playing shows with him on synth. Yeah. Because he's already I mean, he's already a better musician certainly than I am. Um but he he he's really good on the piano. Like um, his piano teacher loves teaching him. Like she told us last week, she was like, "I just love it when he comes for lessons because he really genuinely cares about it." Like some kids go there because their parents make them go. He's there because he loves the piano, and then you can tell. But like the fact that he like you said, like he's learning music theory and like. She has him writing his own songs, like all this stuff. And then he also, over the summer, because we wanted to give him things to do that were constructive, he also took drum lessons. So he took drum lessons all summer also. And um, then he'll have orchestra for a full hour every single day in seventh grade. He was okay. supposed to be in choir also, but they must not have had room in choir. So they put him in art. So he'll be in art for a semester, and then the second semester he'll be doing culinary. Nice. So he's super stoked. So he, like he was bummed he didn't get a choir, but then now he's super excited because he's getting art and culinary. So that's pretty cool. See him, uh, Kanan, at the ripe old age of four. I got him a DW Junior drum set, and yeah, he, he's already that's all awesome about it. That's already his. He's passionate about it in a very. Uh, I, I guess grindcore would be a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But I think it's important, though. Art and, I mean, we're all musicians. We all sing. We all dance. We all draw and color until people tell you you're not good at it. Right. And then we quit. Yeah. At all of us. There's not a child that doesn't sing and dance. Not one. I, I, I locked out having been born into a family that, you know, everybody played an instrument. Everybody was musical. Yeah. Everybody loved music. I mean, my mother turned me on to Black Sabbath. That's amazing. My dad turned me on to The Doors and Iggy and the Stooges and John Coltrane. Like, That's it, wild. It was always, well, my dad was a jazz drummer. You know, yeah. this, this was, awesome. this is where my son gets kind of a leg up because, you know, on dad's side, he gets all of that. On mom's side, jazz royalty, like legitimate jazz royalty. There's so much going for him. He's going to apex anything I was ever even remotely capable of. And I can't oh, wait. I, I hear you. I yeah. can't wait to I'm see it. You. Yeah. 
Mike and I say the exact same thing. Yeah. Any, and yeah, any- I do have envisioned, like we definitely have had conversations about us playing live and him playing the synth yeah. while we sing and play guitar. <laughs> Be I, awesome. I would love to see it. You'd do it, wouldn't you? Yeah. You would. With the mask on. Yeah. 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 Why not? <laughs> if not that at, at the that very, be, actually <laughs> at the very least the mask from the 10 inch yeah <laughs> i told him oh yeah i told him that this mask kind of reminded me of did you watch the moon night yeah yes there, doesn't it sort of put you in the mind of the uh, i can't i can't remember the name of the god Ko, kofu was that was it something like that i can't remember his name it was ethan hawk's character yeah yeah, the yeah, the the, the god, the god that inhabited um the gators. He's the not alligator. a gator, he's like a bird. The the moon knights god. Oh yeah, conchu. Is it conchu, conchu. Conchu, conchu, that's it. Yeah. Like tofu. Like tofu. <laughs> I like tofu. <laughs> and off he goes, so do I. Off he goes. I'm back. He's back. He says I'm back. <laughs> But yeah, uh, you know, I was thinking about this. I'm like, God, I haven't talked to you since last Halloween because we did the Halloween thing, and I don't think yeah. we've since then. Not, not uh, in real time. No, so it's been like almost a year. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of weird. Uh, incidentally, the uh, person most present on this show, with the exception of myself, is you, <laughs> and then, then second. I'm is, sorry. Is Dirk. Michael. Oh, Dirk. And then Mike. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was thinking Malarkey. Oh, oh, Malarkey's been on a lot. Yeah. And so has uh, uh, Damien Moyal from Damien Dunn and As Friends Rust. He's been on a lot. That's but cool. Malarkey shows up a lot. He's, That's uh, awesome. He's another one like you guys. Like once we kind of got acquainted. Yeah. Uh, it just never shut off, I guess. Yeah. Well, I uh, feel like I knew you almost. I mean, we did meet before, but you yeah. know, it was yeah. a million years ago. But like, I really felt like I know this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You also did see me in kind of uh, less than <laughs> some weird positions. I'll put it to you that way. Like, well, Peter and I at our simultaneous worst. <laughs> like wrestling with each other and doing terrible things uh in various states of uh see i don't remember that yeah it, it was um it was i think it was in new york it would have had to have been in new york with ty- with typo negative uh peter and i were a mess like a mess we were we were indulging in things that young ears shouldn't hear about (laughs) as it were Um, i don't remember that and if it was the typo tour it was because i was disassociating from myself (laughs) Mm. that makes sense (laughs) trying to cope that that was that was one of the times we ran across one another um and how i ended up there is even convoluted because i wasn't supposed to be there i was supposed to be i think going home for something, something was going on at home. I decided to stick around because not because typo was playing because I'd, I'd seen them umpteen times. Uh, it was a dime a dozen. They played in this area religiously. Mm. So I was like, okay, I'm going to see Lycia. And there was other bands playing that I liked. And I was going to go and see Josh and Pete since I hadn't seen them in a little bit. And we got into some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that I may or may not have shown up with. I'm I'm not entirely sure, but it was New York. All bets were off. Yeah, I, we uh, really kept to ourselves because we didn't want to. First of all, it was like shell shock, and then also like we're the kind of people that don't want to get in the way, so we just kind of go off someplace. I remember seeing you guys, though. I remember vividly seeing you guys, and then. I don't know, like things became a blur around those dudes, especially yeah. around Pete and around uh, one of the guys from the road crew. Uh, his name was Jimmy. He was 
an absolute pirate of a human being. And he was from Pennsylvania as well. We had a shorthand and that shorthand turned into some of my more toxic leanings as well. <laughs> and we would go and score things that some of the other guys uh, associated with typo negative were not cool with, but we'd show up and Pete was always in and some other people in the band were always in. I'm not going to blow their spots up because they're still here and have to answer to their families. But right. we got into some shit together and it wasn't like anything that we could do time over, but we were, we were partying. Yeah. I'm glad you don't remember that. Because yeah. I, we, <laughs> I definitely don't remember it. And in fact, if it was actual New York city, yeah. We were so shell-shocked by everything at that point that legit, as soon as we walked off the stage, we left. Like, we literally just left because we were just, like, at that point in protect ourselves mode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we didn't stick around. I, re I remember seeing Sam as well. Yeah, Sam was at that one. Yeah, Sam yeah. did that whole tour with us. That's Yeah, yeah he, he, he did, did sound, tour. right? Yeah, he did. He did the whole thing. Yeah. So probably your only your only real recollection of me would have been from music then at CC's. Yeah. Or maybe one of the other times you would have played uh or I'm sorry, the Project Fest. Yeah, right? we played Yeah. 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 I was there yeah. for that too. I was <clears throat> doing street team stuff for Project back yeah. then. Did we hang out on the sidewalk? Because I remember yes. Yes, after we did. that show, I stood outside and hung out with a group of people. Yep. Um, and one of them had been a pen pal that I had met because he was also a Christian and, and was involved in this underground Christian music scene that I had no idea even existed. And it was actual good music, not like that corny like you wouldn't know it was Christian music if nobody told you what it was about or whatever. Uh -huh. And so I remember being like kind of blown away meeting this guy in person because I had been corresponding with him and he was like sending me cassettes back then no. of, and like CDs of like bands and stuff and being kind of like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm not the only Christian person that doesn't have horrendously bad taste in music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh that that was that would have been oh god. I'm trying to remember. Nathan, Nathan. That sounds Nathan. right. Nathan Jones, it sounds right. It sounds like him because he was he turned me on to like bands like Yeti. Like really I can't crazy. remember any of it now. Re but. Like the really crazy, like out there Christian bands that existed in the nineties. Yeah. Yeti was a big one. Uh, I'm trying to remember them all. Uh, I know. I can't, I've completely, like, my brain, I don't hold on to information once I, I don't to. need it anymore. <laughs> but I, I used to, but it, it yeah. becomes more, more difficult to, as the years go by for certain. <laughs> yep. I'm bad about that, anyways. I mean, I, I told somebody a couple of weeks ago if somebody said to me, write out, your album, your songs on your own solo albums. I wouldn't be able to do it. I just don't, my brain doesn't work like that. I couldn't do it for Lycia either. My brain just doesn't work like that. Like I work on something, I'm into it at the time, obsessively. And then once it's done, my brain goes, okay, let's move that over here and move on to this thing over here. I hate that my brain works like that because like, I'm super jealous of people who remember every fact about everything they've ever done. There's collaborations. I had somebody, I had somebody post a, a band on like, ask me, Oh, so there's this band such and such. And I'm like, I have no idea who you're talking about. They're like, you did vocals for them. And I'm like, sorry. Like my brain. Well, I think pe people work. need to understand something about that too. Um, unless you're, you were like present in the studio. 
it's also a part of it. You know what I mean? Like a lot, like the way things work now, if you're going to do vocals for a project for someone else and it's just a one-off, you're usually recording at home and then 100%. sending them like a, a track. You know, it's not the that same part of it. That's definitely not because I'm not involved in the full creative process of it. It's literally like, here's the song, do something for it, you know, and it's over. Like, yeah. I don't have anything to do with the art, the lyrics, none of it. It's just like, so, but, but it still makes me feel like a dirt bag. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, because I can't it's, believe I can't remember this shit. It's, uh, um, you know, dead again, right behind me here. Like you were, you showed up in the studio for that. No, right? I didn't. No, nope. you didn't. Nope. Nope. No, people. It's funny because people be like, "What was it like being in the studio with them?" I'm like, "Wouldn't know." No, this is how it went. Josh sent me a message on MySpace and said, "Be on AI A A O L." No, it was AIM. Is that AOL? Be on yeah, AIM. AIM. Yeah at this time and I'll transfer the file to you. So we literally chatted on aim as he transferred the file. I downloaded it the following day. Mike downloaded it. I recorded my vocals in my closet. He cleaned the, the noise off of it mm -hmm. and we met on aim again <laughs> and transferred the file. And that was it. But it was cool, though, because the original version that I recorded to had Peter singing the part that I sang also. So I sang with him on that track, and it was kind of cool to hear. So he had a slightly different um, melody than I had. Yeah. And I sing in a different style, obviously. But yeah, so it was kind of like I would love to be able to hear that original version but I'm sure it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, I'm sure it does. The thing about that is the, the time period that that album was recorded in was like, it's not like, you know, 25 years ago when we were still kind of dealing with, you know, half analog. Yeah. You know, it's not like it was on DAT anymore. It was already, it was already in Pro Tools. If it's a scratch track, though, like, what's the chances that they held on to it? You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm yeah, you're probably right. This, but I can't imagine that existing. <clears throat> it makes me wonder, though, like, when are those guys ever going to just open the floodgates for everything else that was left over? Because it's my understanding that there are there's at least another album if not more out there of, of or in, in their collection of things that were never released I don't and, know. Like, like, it's hard telling because if they're anything if if josh is anything like mike and mike is like if i die that's it you don't re you don't release things if i wanted it out i would have released it already so I don't know if maybe they're of that same mindset of like, we didn't release it for a reason. Don't release it now just because, I, but you know, who knows? Well, they never, they were never ones after, after Peter, um, you know, was leashed off this mortal coil. They never prostituted things. I mean, it took how long for dead again to get reissued on like, yeah. just, you know, it came out on uh, Steamhammer Records originally, and it was their only record off of Roadrunner. So it was Roadrunner was already a major at that point. They were a Warner subsidiary. Um, you know, the, that they even let that slide for a long time. They didn't reissue the record forever. Um, maybe they're just not prostituting themselves like yeah. mo most others on, they're putting on out stuff pretty steadily like vinyl and stuff like that um and they've got a bunch of merch out there they even did like coffee or something yeah and some um cbd or something like that mm -hmm. but i don't know who like i don't know who spearheads that stuff you know what i mean i don't know if it's more i don't know if the family's more doing it or the band like i don't know how i don't know how it works and i 
I don't know. Josh, you know, I don't talk to Josh a ton, but it's never right. about music. <laughs> when, when I do <laughs> chat with him, it's never, it's always just some random stupid thing. You know? Well, yeah, those guys are goofballs. I mean, obviously, they're not going to be talking about anything serious, especially this late in the game. Um, but the way that bands move now uh, when things are well over, it, it's interesting to see how these legacy groups handle themselves. Yeah. Um, with Lycia being obviously a legacy group at this point, there's not a whole lot of you know, it's not, it, none of it is pandering. It's just, you know, the the label that currently did your reissues, they just did very faithful, well-articulated vinyl reissues. Mm -hmm. Or some of, some of them were just the first time ever on vinyl. Actually, a majority yeah. were the first right. time ever on vinyl. Right. Um, but there's none of this, like, eye towards oversaturation of merchandising where that's by does that is by design also because yeah. mike is like no we have a finite amount of people that listen to our music like it's not an infinite money cow you're not going to make a bunch of money off this there's you're going to sell this many and then you're not going to sell anymore mm -hmm. and so he's very been very adamant about not doing that because there's been times when you know he would say like print this amount and that's it and he wasn't listened to and then down the line they're like these records aren't selling it's like i told you mm -hmm. this many like so we he's been very adamant about not oversaturating and like knowing the boundary of because the last thing we ever want is records sitting on a shelf someplace like yeah. it's a waste of money to the person who paid for them and they're just sitting there. So this is the very reason why he put all of our personal stock up on Bandcamp to sell because we're like, why do we just stockpile records in our house? Like, there's no point in having cases and cases and cases of these records sitting here and no one's listening to them. So he put them all up on Bandcamp and there was not a single person that ordered one thing and only got one thing. Yeah. We, if you ordered something, you got something else with it, <laughs> you know, because yeah. we're like, I would rather give this away and know that somebody's listening to it than for it to just be sitting on a shelf someplace. And well, the, go ahead. That's the thing about the, the, someone who is a Lycia fan though, because you're not just going like, it's, it's a veracity. There's, there's a, it, it's like being. I hate to put it this way, but like uh, uh, an underdog team fan, almost you're not just going to go out and buy a, a, a ball cap. You're getting the Jersey and you're going the whole nine. That's how it is for every band that kind of never got their due, but was always ahead of the curve. It's how I always was with every band I ever loved. Really? Um, you, you go the whole way. Mm -hmm. you, you can't like every iteration of Ionia, which there's three pressings, three different uh, variants of the vinyl pressing. Mm -hmm. I have them all. Um, I think there were two different of cold. I have them both like every vinyl pressing I have, you know, with your help. Um, but I, I kind of have it all now and I would have felt, naked if i didn't and, and i, I think felt like that too i'm like because when we were designing these and you know you put yourself like well which one would i want i'm like there's mm -hmm. no way i could pick i want all of them yeah They're all all. like it's hard and i do i go through that too when i'm buying somebody else's vinyl i'm like i want all of them they're all beautiful mm -hmm. like it's hard that's why like i'm sure that's why soft kill kills it because they put out these beautiful products and like as a fan, you're like, okay, well, I got this one, but I want that one too. Yep. You know, and and you could you could probably ask, you know, Nicole and Toby. I I've probably ordered every variant of every vinyl and cassette of yeah. of everything they've produced in the past decade or so, 
uh, religiously. Yeah. Because, because a, I know that it's, it's a real thing. They're not, yeah. this isn't just, you know, some money grab. No, they're, not at all. Not at all. They're doing this from home. Yeah. They're running this now out of Chicago, but out of their home, out of their yeah. little red house in Chicago, they're fucking yeah. doing this shit. So it's, it's laborious. It's not just, uh, you know, some guy in his mansion collecting right. royalties off of, off of a product that some other person is coming right. up with and, and, and designed it. And yeah. 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 It's, it's all, and it's house. not, it's not an abuse of their fan. You know what I mean? No. Because, because like some people are that way, they get greedy mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I'm going to release this because I know these people will buy it. That's never, ever entered our brain. Like literally it's always that. First of all, we want to have it on vinyl because it's freaking cool to have your record on vinyl. Yeah. And that you design, you know, you help design it. Well, you did design it. Mike did all of our design. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had a hand in picking colors and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but like, it was never, it's never like, let's have three variations. So one person will buy all three. No, it's because we want those cool freaking colors. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and even with the whole band camp thing, like Mike years ago made everything name your own price because it was like more important for people to be listening to the music than for us to get 99 cents or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we never, you never hear us complaining about people downloading music for free or, or listening to shit on Spotify or whatever. It's like, I don't care where you're listening to it. The fact that you even give a shit enough to listen is mind blowing after all these years and all the, you know, all the drama of it all. And people still want to listen. And I still get messages from people saying, I just discovered your band. Like yeah. that blows my mind. And they're like kids, you know, you're Why? never, you guys are never going to see the end of that. And, and I here's, hope not. you're not going to because, and here's, here's the real reason why too. You guys never pandered to a scene specifically. That's true. Um, <laughs> That's true. You, it, you try like not for a lack of trying by labels, but <laughs> uh, you know, like hang a hat on it, this, that, or the other thing. But yeah. <clears throat> as we talked about the first time we ever did an interview, it, it wasn't the dark wave they wanted it to be or the ethereal or the goth or the, whatever you want to fucking call it that they tried to hang onto you guys as, as an albatross around your necks. It was always just, this really intricate, lush, trippy post-punk that, you know, paid allegiance to those that had come before the, 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 the cures, mm -hmm. the killing jokes that came before, but it was always a very singular experience and it never fit in with anything. And that's why other artists on project, who have been on this show have said, I was always jealous of Lycia because you guys did this and you guys had this listenership and it was always a sell through because of this, because it wasn't pandering. It wasn't on the nose. It wasn't trying to sound like the sisters of mercy or the wake or the mission UK. It was its own perfect little monster. And, and, and you get to, carry that for the rest of your lives as being your legacy so you're always going to get this new person who's going to crop up and be like yeah i just found this i can't live without this here's why i love this the same way pink floyd are going to get that forever the same way the clash are going to get that forever the same way slayer are going to get that forever because it's its own thing it didn't buy into the hype you know what's interesting about that too is we didn't fit in back in the day. And at that time it was a hindrance, right? Like, you know, people would be like, Ugh, like that's not what I expected or whatever. But now it's at some point it went from being a hindrance to a benefit. Like, yep. like now 
because you kind of weathered the storm of it, no one expects you to be anything now. Like you, you go from being expected to be a certain way to like, oh, you're not. So it's cool. Like, I don't know when the switch flipped or whatever, but now it's like we people just leave us alone to do our thing and it's fine. Like no but, one ever goes now. You're not goth. Like nobody gives a shit anymore. And I love that. That always existed, but in very, very finite numbers. Because I yeah. recall I recall way, way back, way back seeing, you know, like pictures of Mike in in, in flannel with long hair. And you with always these very interesting haircuts and, and, and great makeup that I don't know what it was, but yeah, <laughs> ob that obviously d d like it was it was crazy. It was more punk, more Nancy Spongin than Susie Sue. You know, it, it always had that 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 you know bite to it that wasn't trying to play into the whole goth mystique. It was always more like a middle finger or a finger or a thumb in the eye to that, uh, that I always found revelatory. That's why it spoke to me. That's why I, I you know, I, I hate to keep shitting on project because, you know, great label, such cool <laughs> stuff happened there. Um, no matter the, how it all shook out, yep. you, you know, it was a nice little place for you guys to be. It was, it was cool. It was different. Uh, it, it wasn't Cleopatra Records, which Cleopatra is a neat little spot now to be too after all these years. But Project was kind of perfect for you to be in because there was, it was kind of an eclectic mix. Really? But there was nothing quite like Lycia there. To have a, a place where like, you guys didn't fit in to begin with, but you, you didn't even fit in on your own label. That's a rare, <laughs> that's a <laughs> True. That's a cool, rarefied place to be. I wouldn't trade that for anything. Yeah. I'm definitely like, I mean, I am very, very proud of Mike that he's always done his thing. And yes, there were times that he bent his will to, to somebody else's and whatever, but the music was never affected by it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. decisions were made that, that weren't our choice necessarily. But, but that was marketing. Yeah, and it was like art and whatever. And but it, the brilliant thing of it is now is that he's literally will walk at it. He'll just walk if things aren't gonna go the way he envisions it. And it's not a like I will, I need to have my way or no way or anything like that. But it's just like like he kind of said earlier, if he plays some shows, cool. If he doesn't play some shows, cool. So it's like, oh, that guy's going to come out on vinyl. You don't want to do it the way I want, envision it. Then I won't put it out on vinyl. Like, yeah. it's it's a freeing mindset. And I think a lot of that, too, stems from the fact that art truly is just art for us. It's not paying our bills. It's not, I mean, it, it helps pay the bills. But we're not relying on it to pay the bills, so we don't have to be as stressed out about shit. Like when you're a touring musician that has to pay their bills based off touring, and you know, it removes a whole lot of that pressure. And and plus the whole age thing, it's kind of like I'd rather not do it at all than compromise. Yeah. So I mean, and that took place years and years and years ago. We were still young people when that attitude came in, but um. Yeah, it's just we're in a good spot because we can do it. We cannot do it. It is what it is. You know, like like he said, if he's here playing for the Greyhounds and, and Dirk, that's just as good. So I don't know. We'll see. I don't know what I don't know what is next, if anything. But I, I just hope that the uh, remainder of the catalog that hasn't been reissued by the label finally gets to get that same care and treatment because that first uh, surge of records that, that yeah. you know got that kind of care as far as uh, you know reissue and and how beautifully it all came about I just hope that somewhere continues because yeah. I thought that documentation and, and that 
reverence for uh, you know something that didn't necessarily need to be uh, improved upon just gets documented. Yeah. I think that's very important. And at the very least, I hope that label has the foresight to follow through with the rest of it. Selfishly, I want to see them all on vinyl also, just because yeah. it's such a, it's so, it's, it blows your mind to see that stuff in that beautiful packaging and with that beautiful art. And avant-garde has been insanely generous and supportive. Like, I, I literally can't say enough good things about them. They're, they're fantastic. Um, uh, but Mike is very measured in what he, what he does and how he does it. So, um, I need to see Estrella on vinyl. That's what I, know. I need. I That's what I need. I think I want to see Burning Circle. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see Bleak, and I would love yeah. to see Mike Soul out. I mean, you know. But again, I'm selfish, and I want all of it. I'm, yeah, <laughs> but vinyl. I mean, Mike, but, that doesn't need to come out on vinyl. I'm like, yeah, it does. Uh, Estrella, especially because there's something. Like I've said this to you before. Estrella is very, very unique and special to the Lycia catalog because that is the terror record to me. It's definitely different. Like it's it's one of these kids is doing its own thing kind of. I, I love that about that album. There, There's something very unifying to the entire body of all of Lycia's work that is inherent to that record. It has everything that was great about everything before you showed up and it was the like the culmination of everything you'd done thereafter it, there was something about that record that was so cohesive and so brilliantly uh you know cogent it was it was the it was the true marriage of two things i wish i had a, a like the means to have that on on a, a, a definitive physical copy. To me, that's the ultimate Tara and Mike record. Yeah. I and you know, you've done so many great things, especially as Mike said. You know, in Flickers is a fucking triumph, and the well, ten inch is a triumph. Um, I return to that record more than any other Lycia album. There's something about <laughs> Estrella. It's funny because like that was an interesting time because Dave had just left mm -hmm. and we toured and played a bunch of them songs. So they weren't even released yet. So we were playing the set full of songs nobody had ever heard before, which yeah. irritated the shit out of some people, I'm sure. <laughs> But, uh, and plus I was singing, so also like, no. But, um, so when we went to record it, like we had already hammered out most of those songs because we were playing them live. So the recording, like, I don't remember the recording being complicated at all. But then again, I, like, I don't, I, none of the stuff back then, it, of course, I always just come in and do my part and leave. Mike's the one that has to do all the work to it, but. I know he was super meticulous about the recording of that. And I have to say, though, I friggin' hate the original cover of that record. Why? Fucking hate it. Because I... He took a beautiful picture. The original picture for that cover is gorgeous. And put, like, these ugly yellow tones on it. And a radial blur that makes my nose look gigantic. Like, I just, I hate that cover. <laughs> Personal preference, I just hate the cover. Right. But, like, the new cover, I think, is freaking beautiful. Plus, it has the purples and greens, which are the color of the lights that we used when we yeah. toured. Yeah, in those that, that, that blew my mind. That blew my mind on that tour, yeah. So, I love, 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 love. And, and the girl who took the original cover 
actually came up to our house because she lived in Columbus, came up to our house in Streetsboro and took a bunch of pictures. So, and like we set up our lights that we used on that tour. So all that purple and, and those were our colors, you know, whatever. But like, I love the new, the new cover, but yeah, I don't, I never liked the original. You know what though? The, the, the well, Oh, I didn't like it, but anyway. You know, the the original cover was not the promo cover. What was True. the promo cover? The promo cover was more akin to the new cover. I don't know if you remember this or not. You don't. I, the promo cover, uh, it was just, you know, just like an LP sleeve. Open at the top, you know, mm -hmm. the, no gatefold. It was just like a regular. A sleeve thing. A, a regular sleeve. Yeah. And it was it was uh it was matte finished. No, oh, interesting. Purples and 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 there was a dark, um, almost like tan hue, and purple and 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 pinks, a wash throughout your face. Interesting. And it, and it made you look vampiric, yet angelic. And that dichotomy came through really, really simply in in this wash of color. I, I loved it so much. I still have it somewhere uh, because I used it's to get probably it. the original picture without the color fuckery. I don't because it's. Yeah. I don't know where I put my phone, but um, yeah, it's a it's from the same girl took those pictures. We we went to play Columbus, and for whatever reason, they're like, "Oh, we're gonna go take your picture in this park." We're like, "Okay," and they took us off to this park and she took the best pictures that were ever taken of us. Mm -hmm. I post them kind of regularly because they're just beautiful pictures. And it, that image was one that she took and, and it's such a great picture. Like I never think I look good. And I'm like, she made me look good. I like that picture. But anyway, um, and then when we got the covers, I'm like, what, why is it? First of all, I don't like yellow. Mm -hmm. So that right there, turns me off but yeah anyway i don't need to keep bitching about shit but well, no i mean like aesthetically <laughs> speaking the uh that that promo uh, looked like you were standing in some kind of cemetery looking thing yeah yes well yes. because it was this park that had a very cemetery looking vibe um and actually the pictures from the new version of cold are from that same session. So mm -hmm. all the artwork on the new version of Cold, the picture of from Estrella is from that same set. So the the promo pictures of you guys from Cold were uh, my favorites of of you and Mike too, because there was something about you two together in those photos that that I don't know, kind of spoke to a a deeper romantic resonance almost there was a uh, something magical about those promotional I photos i remember it, which pictures they used for they were on the cards the cards right yes yeah, the same yeah that's those are the pictures that she took i have all of those in uh one of my uh photo album style binders behind plastic where you stick them and there's that the, yeah. the double sided yeah 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 because i had thousands of them because I was on the street team. So uh, all that stuff was like shipped to me regularly uh, that I was to give out to record stores and pass out at shows. And I, I dutifully did for certain, but I still ended up with a clutch of them for yeah. my own personal delectation, which I edified to a great degree because of, of uh, who Lycia were and are to me now. Uh, but I remember you know, just lo like really studying these and, and, and looking at the compositions and being so blown away by how well done they were as compared to what they'd done for basically almost everyone else on that label, except with the exception of the cold meat productions mm -hmm. stuff, sure, sure, which, sure, sure. which I thought aesthetically was very cool as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, see, that was more our aesthetic too. Yeah. We lean more towards that sort of dark, I don't even know what you, like metal-ish. 
Very black metal. Uh, yeah, like, but yeah, that's all Tondalea. She took those pictures and like, we were like, there wasn't a bad picture in the set. Like she just, and that time of the day, because the sun was going down. So there was this like beautiful, the magic glow, hour, like orange glow. And like, mm -hmm. just the, the trees were barren, you know, um, funny side note to that. That's the day I met. I think that's the day I met Gordon Sharp from Cindy talk. Really? And cause he was living in Columbus at the time and came to that show. And I just immediately just fell in love with him. Like <laughs> just love him. And we start, became friends and like, we saw they came up and Cindy talk played um, Cleveland. We saw them there. And then ironically at this, I think this was, yes, this was, that happened before we saw them in Cleveland. Cindy talk played Cleveland. We went, then we played, we came out to Tempe on vacation. And while we were here, Cindy talk and trans to the sun were playing a show. Well, we're, good friends with trance of the sun yeah so we went there and um one of the guys in the band from cindy talk was like says to mike you're the guy from the pisser because they all had shaved heads and he also had a shaved head at the time so it like resonated or something yeah but and then then after that was when we met gordon in columbus and i just freaking adore him such a great guy. He's super <laughs> supportive. Like, just so nice. And truly Definitely. one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard in my entire oh, life. Yes. Yes. But there, there was some, like, that was that era. There were a lot of unpretentious people making really important music at that time period. Um, Trance of the Sun sadly never got the same due that Lycia did. Also, very... Oh well-made very uh out of place music yeah but which is why we fit perfectly together yeah like it used to blow my mind because we i got to watch them every night and i say i got to watch them because i truly loved watching them and i would be so confused because i'm like looking at them going this music is fucking amazing Zoe has one of the best voices I've ever heard. And what she's doing is completely different from what anyone else is doing. And all these people are standing around confused and bored and like literally heckling her. <sighs> like I wanted to fist fight people on a nightly basis. And Mike and I were like, what, what is not resonating with these people? Like we tried to get them signed and <laughs> to project and everything because I'm like, you know, we were in it with Chance of the Sun. Um, just, yeah. I And, and they eventually did get them. signed by Project. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, eventually. Music's not a joke to me, so I never got people that don't take their music seriously. No, and, and I have I have it on good authority that both of your solo records are so far from like uh, 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 levity, you know, the like starkly, starkly emotional, realistic. And as I'd said, somewhere in between in league with Susie and the Banshees and the Cure and Led Zeppelin, there are things on those records that sound so eastern and 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 gypsy ask uh it, it, it's it's as if i'm traveling up the carpathian mountains on a, a a gypsy covered wagon at points and then it turns into something more urbane and like uh tony scott's the hunger it all gets mixed up in this miasma of 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 dark feelings and, and, and suffering. And it becomes so beautiful at points. I've told you this before. There are legitimate points where it reminds me of immigrant song by Led Zeppelin. And sometimes it takes me to folk music. You pulled out a lot of stops for those records. 
and it bums me out that I only got two. <laughs> it really does. That, that's, I, like I'm sitting here going, are, are you talking about my solo record? <laughs> But you know I love those records. I'm, I've never stopped talking about those records. I've it's never stopped. Brother. Like, it's, I don't know. They, I don't not like my own music. I just, I'm, I just have a hard time thinking that anybody else really likes it. I had, a, I had, have, and will always have a serious affinity for those two records. They... To me, they had more in common with. I'm a massive, massive, massive Tori Amos fan. Massive, especially the first three records. They have more in common with Tori Amos than they do with Susie and the Banshees because Tori came from having survived a gang rape and having been brutalized. I'm not saying that's what happened to you, obviously, but mm -hmm. stark realities are shown. Uh, just song after song after song. There's no, it's relentless in its attack. Uh, that's how Tori did it with the first three records. That's how you did it with those two records. It's just an, a relentless approach to rigorous honesty matched with like, you know, e strange Eastern musicianship and, and, and obvious killing joke worship that it <laughs> resonated with me in a very special way. Um, always, always did from the day both of them surfaced until now, I've always resonated with them. Uh, it's they're spooky. They're, That's interesting. Do you remember the first time I told you there's a, I, I felt a very Led Zeppelin vibe from them. Both. That's so bizarre to me. Yeah, because you don't even like Led Zeppelin, really. It's not oh, no, I do thing. like, no, I definitely like Led Zeppelin. I just had no exposure to them as a young person. So, like, they're not an influence on me. Right. But, um, like, that's bizarre to me. Well, when, now that you have, I guess, kind of a, more of a, I don't know, purchase of, of what they've yeah. done with Eastern musics and, and, uh, you know, songs like Kashmir specifically, which is what I found to be kind of like a recurring theme with uh, both of them, but especially uh, this one was Liquid Honey. Uh, there's there's an Eastern thing going on there, a gypsy thing going on there. That's interesting. I don't know. It, it feels mystical. It constantly, like like that, that mysticism reverberates throughout that record. I listen back to it. It is closer to my summation than the last time I listened to it. That's interesting. Whoa. So this is, so two points in that. The, the first one is just kind of a funny thing. So I remember when the first record came out um, and I would get sent reviews, like Project would clip them out and put them in a folder and send them to you. And I remember reading this one review and the guy was like, this is like Sid Barrett, but it was supposed to be an insult. And I'm like, that makes sense to me. How and is I'm, that I think, I, They thought it because it was so weird to them. Like it was like, this is some weird Sid Barrett shit or whatever. And I'm like, I'll take that compliment. Fuck but yeah. <laughs> the, the second thing is, so I don't even know anymore really where my headspace was with the first one. Because I was like young. Like I was probably only like 25 or something. Mm -hmm. pretty young um but i was still in the same mindset i was in from my first band so my my first band i i my goal was unintentionally my goal was to kind of capture this like weird child that little tara little four-year-old tara with the devilish smile thing because I always wanted to just be a kid. I hate, for, I don't like to be a grown up. I want to just be a little kid and innocent, you know, before you realize how awful things are. Yeah. And so, like, a lot of the lyrics and stuff were from this sort of demented child, not demented, corrupted maybe, child thing or whatever. 
So I think the first album has a lot of that, like weird nursery rhyme kind of um, on an acid trip, literally thing going on. And then the second one, it was more because I was writing that record the same time I was writing my book, my first one. Yeah. And so it was definitely this kind of escapism into creating a different reality. So maybe that's where the Eastern Led Zeppelin vibe but, comes from, but I don't but know. But the, the instrumentation as well kind of adopts a very bohemian flavor. Um, I get the Sid Barrett illusions because that makes sense. Sid Barrett very much subverted expectations by by um, he submersed himself in in, in uh, strange classical musics mm-hmm. from everything from uh, Sardinian classical music to Welsh uh, folk music. There was so much involved in what Sid had done with Opal and all of those records that still resonates with me in a very specific way. But um, the span of two records, you you very much exercised uh, a specific demon that I thought translated very well to tape. Well, that's um, good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just kind of, f- it felt unfinished. It felt like there needed to be a third. It, it Everything I do is unfinished. Like, it's always unfinished. Like, you know, I hate the fact that I have, I'm not recording music. But I also hate the fact that I haven't written every single book that's in my head. Because I know where a lot of the stories are going. And this person has a story. And that person has a story. And that person. But there's only so much time to do any of it. And... Uh, that's one of the things that takes so long to get anything done because I'm like, I'm going to work on, like I, I very much subscribe to the thing of work on what feels right in the day. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm deep in the middle of a book and all of a sudden it doesn't feel fun to me anymore, I'd stop it and then move to something else or whatever. And so that I've got like probably six books in varying stages of, written and a whole bunch more that are still up here that haven't been started yet but so but yeah music the fact that i don't write music anymore is like i never envisioned that i wasn't going to do that anymore but i mean you're saying not anymore it's just not as of yet yeah five years or maybe a month from now five years from now 15 years from now who knows? But yeah, like, yeah. I, like I don't like to say never anymore because I've we've eaten that word so many times. Right. So will I ever? Re- I mean, I've done songs here and there. Right. But if I'm not finding it fun, then I'm not doing it. And like at this point, like I would have to relearn how to record. Like, all the tips and tricks that I had down pat and, like, all of that. Like, again, that's what my brain does. When I'm in it, I'm in it. When I'm out of it, my brain goes, bye. (laughs) So I don't have to, like, relearn all of that stuff again. And, like, you know, I don't have the inspo right now. But that happens a lot where you're super honed in on one thing and then it gets derailed. Like, I don't know how many projects that I was supposed to be working on with people and I'm in it and I'm working on it and then they go MIA and then I'm like all right I guess that's done we won't be doing that anymore and uh you know Mike talked about earlier about just not trusting people based on past experience it's kind of just the same thing like people are all gung-ho and they're like let's do this project together and I'm like yes let's do this project together and I'm putting in the fucking work on it And then that's it. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess focus on me because, (laughs) and then I feel like I keep telling people I'm not doing vocals. I'm not, I'm not collaborating anymore. And like, I've had some really cool people say, Hey, let's do, you do want to do vocals on this? And I listen to their music and I'm like, Oh my God, I really do want to do vocals on that. But I said, no, and I'm not doing it. 
So I'm like, no, now. Ask me again later. Maybe my answer will be different. But then, then, then a friend will be like, hey, do you want to do vocals on this thing? And I'm like, no, but yes. It's frustrating. And I just give, more, give myself more work is the bottom line. <laughs> but I got to be on some really cool projects because of that. So. Yeah, but in the same token, you can only you can only give what's reciprocated, right? For sure, yes. I mean, and I'm I'm done begging people. Like, first of all, I've never been a good beggar in the first place. But I did used to chase people a little bit more than I do now. Now it's like I'm not. I you don't want to be involved, then we're not going to, it's fine. Like, it's fine. Um, I'm not, if somebody wants to do something and then there's no follow-up on it, whatever. Disappointing, yeah. but whatever. Yeah, and not to get into anything that we both know what we're talking about, but there's a, you know, when someone abuses the friendship that's put out there, uh, especially when it's over lengthy periods of time where, you, you know, you put forth the effort, it's not reciprocated, uh, and, you know, you suffer it for a long time. You, sure. You're like, okay, I'm going to just forgive this person predicated on past experience. Like, we, we've always yeah. had this yeah, yeah, yeah. understanding. You reach a point where it becomes abuse. Yeah. And I'm not cool with that. Like, yeah, it, 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 I, pull it, my, it just, I pull my disappearing acts, but I never, I'm never not available. Right. You, there's, a difference. there's a difference. There is a difference. And like, it, it, it's been the story kind of my whole life where, um, like I think I'm cool with somebody. This happened clear back in high school, but it's like, oh, well, there's somebody cooler to hang out with today. So I'm going to mm -hmm. go hang out with that person. But if they're not available tomorrow, I'll come back over and hang out with you. Like this has been a reoccurring ongoing theme. And it's not like I, it's unique to me. Lots of people go through this. People come along when they feel like, oh, like there's, it's an amazing how many people appear when we have an album coming out. Like, haven't heard from you in, like, six years. Oh, you got a record coming up? Better check in with them. Like, yeah. I don't know what the, the – I don't, I don't know if it's just they're, they're reminded that they were my friend or if it's, like, some kind of, oh, they might get some attention, so maybe I can get some of that attention, too. I don't know how that works. I, I don't like to think of that, but – That's called – It's really strange how certain people tend to – come around at specific times. <laughs> it's called affluenza. When someone is, you know, when somebody's hot, when someone's affluent mm. or, or perceived as cool, all of the bandwagoners come calling. It's so gross too. Let, really? let me get on this fucking bandwagon and just roll with it. Um, it's like I mean, if you're trying to hitch your wagon to mine, like mine's not going anywhere, so yours is going to be stuck even farther back. Sorry to tell you that. <laughs> even if that's not the case, though, <laughs> uh, uh, the disingenuousness of uh, yeah, showing, so showing up when you know the iron's hot—it's it's obvious. It's, it really is. The funny thing is, is I never play like I get it. Cause why? Like, I, I, who cares? Like really, literally who cares? Like in my mind, I know, but there's no reason to be weird about it, but you, you learn who your, your friends are and you learn who are your acquaintances, I guess. Right. I just, I hope that I've, uh, I hope that I've put across, uh, how, sincere i am in my intentions of course over the, you know the past two years and absolutely furthermore, furthermore there's a <clears throat> there's a fanboy in me that really does i i do feel kind of beholden to everything that you guys have done 
that I, I think sets apart, uh, you know, the trajectory and the, you know, the sincerity that you, you guys have put forth that I, resonated with me for time immemorial, uh, you know, especially from, you know, I, I, I loved Lycia precursor to your involvement, but there's really something unique and almost bicameral that occurred when, when you were interjected into the, the whole sphere of the group. It became yin and yang, very uh, two sides of the same coin that I don't, I don't think would have been possible had you not reared your head into, you know, the equation. Worst it, <laughs> and, 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 and never more apparent than with, I keep mentioning, you know, Estrella has this perfect harmony of, of that, that uh, Arboros, mm. that yin and yang, where it, the cycles just intermingle so perfectly. Um, it makes me wonder, how was it uh, during the recording? Was that the most uh, reciprocal it had ever been? up to that point I don't know those I like I don't remember any like you know you know you know when you are working on a song and like it's not coming and you really are working on it and working on it everything just kind of happened like mm -hmm. there was I didn't struggle with lyrics Mike didn't struggle with writing song like it just like, I don't remember a ton about it because it was just like effortless, I guess. Now, it wasn't effortless for him because he literally was meticulous about the actual production of like the mastering and the all that stuff, you know. But as far as the songs and stuff, it was very just flowed. Like there wasn't any, no drama. And, you know, and part of that, too, is that it was just the two of us. And, like, we've always just worked well together. Yeah. You know, there's, I do what I'm told. I mean, and I know that sounds like a weird thing, but I don't mean it like I'm being bossed around. It's just, like, if I'm told I'm here at a certain time, I'm there at a certain time. If I'm told we're working on this song today, I work on, like, I just do. Because... Part of that, too, is probably because I came in as a fan and I've always been like, I know that my place is not guaranteed. Like, it's not a guarantee that I'm going to be on the next Lycia record ever. I don't take that for granted and I don't assume anything. You know, if yeah. Mike wants to put out an album and it's literally just him, there's no skin off my teeth about it. It is, you know, I'm like literally, literally, I don't ever look that gift horse in the mouth ever. Um, but that record was just and just easy, and then you know the hard one was tripping back. Like that one was hard, yeah, um, for so many reasons. But yeah, for Australia, just we were in a good place at that point. You know, that, that magic's apparent, and it makes sense to me that you say that because it it was such an effortless listen. Yeah when you hearken back to it, when, when, when you, you know, really immerse yourself in that recording and, and the way it all, you know, pieces together, none of it's forced, none of it even remotely. It really feels, wasn't. Yeah. It, it, it's just so simple and so clean. And even, <laughs> even beyond all that, there's something like, like very apparently spiritual about that, that listening experience that to me feels, I don't, I don't know, just a, a perennial almost like it, it, there's no way it could not have been. Well, that's it, interesting. It, 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 it just, it returns and it's, you know, uh, a constant return. You listen to it, <clears throat> you get something different every time almost. Uh, I listen to it today. It's not the same experience as 15 years ago. It's not the experience as 15 days ago. It just, it That's keeps cool. evolving. Yeah. It's fun. 
it's fun it, and that's it makes it a classic it, it, it renders it a classic um, it's funny because you know every once in a great while someone will say that that's their favorite record and i'm always like what and it's mine for sure it's, it's just mine. bizarre because you know i'm very rarely does that happen but um <laughs> it always blows my mind when it does but because i'm partial to the stuff i'm not on <laughs> <laughs> honestly yeah because you approach um, as a fan yeah and also it's just how can my favorite song be my song like that's weird but think about it <laughs> think about it from this aspect uh the time it came out it was we were reach we were like kind of heading into the late 90s mm -hmm. we were in that uh grunge hangover um we were definitely in that uh <clears throat> it was in the decline. The that decline. Was the decline for sure. Yeah. yeah. And and you get this kind of ultimate statement out of it, where ever like there are kind of like two camps as far as the Lycia fan is concerned. They're the uh, early uh, Ionia fan, where they they mm -hmm. they they're wistful for you know. Mike in his early stages, and then there are the people who embraced what was to come, mm -hmm. uh, which was inarguably the better of it all because nobody starts out perfect. It's just not possible. And uh, if you follow Mike's trajectory, it, it starts to really realize itself when he finds you and, you know, you guys – come together there's obviously going to be some sort of magic predicated upon romance and whatnot that's going to realize itself in song uh no greater document and 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 you know realization of that than astraea astraea is fucking as close to perfect as you're going to get as far as the sound is concerned uh, it really, it, it, I remember it grabbing people that would never have listened to music of that ilk. That's and interesting. I had a promo copy of it that I played for the owner of the club that I got you guys booked at in Music, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And he's like, uh, you know, I'm used to you bringing me bands like VOD and, 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 and you know, propane and guar yeah. and, and stuff like that. And I, I show up with this being something mellifluous, something with uh, 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 an eye and an ear toward the melodic and, and you know, the Stygian, something darker, something uh, more nuanced, less in your face and brutal. And I say, this is the band that you need to book. You need to be involved with this. Vince was the gentleman's name. Uh, and I'm this guy trying to book hardcore bands and, and brutal yeah. death metal bands. And I'm like, here, here, here's this. And he's like, I can play this in front of my mother and it's fine. Very but true. I, <laughs> I, I, I play it in front of a, a woman that I'm romantically interested in and it's and it has something there, but it also has something introspective and, and uh, poetic in its way. And it resonates and it makes sense to someone like that who doesn't understand the music of the time. And, you know, he books it and makes it happen. And I'm so elated. I'm yeah, that was a good show. That it was, was good. You know, oh, it was so, that was a fun night. It was a it, fun night. And and I always hoped that people would resonate with the fact that I, I I tried my best to get something greater than just uh, scene oriented zeitgeist mm -hmm. and, and 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 show them something else, uh, allow them into you know my own personal ideas of what's great and what's beautiful and it happened and 
I'm still like there was a documentary about that club. Oh, cool! Within the past, and and Lycia gets mentioned, but it's not like a focal point. Yeah, and I'm bummed about it because it should have been like a defining moment for uh, an area and a scene that was ruled by tough guy hardcore and as much as I was a part of that and I liked that it wasn't really my heart my heart was in the combination of all of those mm-hmm. things and the culmination of all those things and I, I, it sounds stupid but you know that was that was what made my world kind of turn at that point yeah the, the dichotomy of those things yeah sure I'll always be beholden to that in a way that that occurred that that time happened and I don't like to live in the past because it's silly but right I, I do cherish that that point yeah for sure I miss that whole era like you know we're all young and still had hopes mm-hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> I still had hope for things good things in life no but you know you you miss that being young and <coughs> optimistic and you know yeah i'll get in the van and go and stand in front of people and potentially be humiliated sure that sounds like a good plan now i'm like go to my son's choir concert i'm going to have anxiety attacks over that you know what i'm saying like yeah. oh go to a restaurant i've never been to before and i don't know what the ordering process is like there oh now i have anxiety like come on like, do i have, do i have to download an app for that right now yeah for real <laughs> for real yeah pretty much that's what i do i order everything on an app and go pick it up so i don't have to deal with anything <laughs> but see that's the difference in me now versus me yes i'll get on a plane and go to mexico city where i don't speak the language and have no clue what's going to happen let's do it <laughs> <laughs> i guess to kind of like wrap it up because i'm going to pass out soon but <laughs> if, if we were to kind of put a fine point on you know i i've done this show for two years i've done a hundred episodes you've been the person that shows up the most on this show um, what keeps you coming back to all of this? Because it's all very silly and, and, and I don't know, innocuous. Why do you keep showing up for me? Because I like you. And because I enjoy having conversations with people that I like. And we can go from many tangents. Um but just kind of have the same take on it most of the time. Like not always exactly, but enough of where you're pointing things out to me, I would not get otherwise. And I don't know. I'd like to talk to you. (laughs) (laughs) Logistically, it is a goofy format. I mean, in all reality, Um, I, I engage these people in, a manner in which that I would like to think no one else engages them in. Yeah. Uh, I, I know. I, I hope so. You do. I hope so. I mean, it all comes back strangely to two people, my mom or three people, my mom, my dad, and my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom was always like sideways terrified of me because <laughs> I, w- I was so much like my father in a way. Uh, my dad was a, a, he was crazy, but he was a deep thinker. Hmm. Um, I would tell him, I would tell him things that would blow his mind. Like my family's cabin was situated on a, a, a beef cow farm that the farmer would not kill the cows. He had, didn't have the heart for it. So he just kept them to keep the grass down basically. Aww. Yeah. He was a great guy. Billy Daniels was his name. And, uh, I remember being on said farm and saying to my dad, 
you ever wonder maybe like they're behind a fence, but if they think that maybe we're the ones that are fenced in because they get to just eat grass and walk around and live as freely as they can possibly surmise. And, you know, they don't really have a care. They have food, they have their families, yeah. they have a shelter. And, you know, we have to worry about reality. Yeah. Bullshit. You know, um, blew his mind, blew his entire mind when I was a small child. Uh, now, my wife's take on it is I'm an excellent bullshit artist, and I can talk to anyone and, and draw out the kernel of truth in their spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I, in my opinion, it's none of those things. I'm just, I just talk and give people enough room to speak back. The truth's probably somewhere in the middle of all of that. But uh, I'm very grateful and thankful that you keep coming back here. Yeah, well, keep asking. I'll keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's wonderful and appreciated. And yep. uh, coming from one of my all-time favorite uh, groups, I, I couldn't be more fortunate. So I thank you for that. Well, thank you for giving a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerely, I mean that. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to go lay down and go to sleep. Um, but listen, uh, I love you dearly. And mm -hmm. I hope we can keep doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And right back at you. All right, dear. <laughs> Good to see you again. Don't go night night. I will. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, aren't we just precious? <laughs> That's it, folks. This is the end of the very, very massive book of very, very bad things. Episode 100 Extravaganza Expo. <laughs> I appreciate you all very much for taking this ride and indulging me and you know just being a part of my world for an hour or two every Friday night and uh, hey I love you guys let's hope we do another hundred together yeah reach out to me if there's an artist you want to hear from in the context of this show let me know your thoughts your feelings dm me on instagram message me on facebook wherever you want to reach out just reach out i don't bite unless my wife asks me to <laughs> so from kanan and tiana and myself the book of very very bad things crew the 333 a.m. studios denizens we bid you a fond good evening they've been mike and tara lycia i've been peter you've been beautiful and this has been the book of Very, Very Bad Things Podcast's 100th episode. Good night. Take care. And I'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye, everybody.
The Book of Very, Very Bad Things is a 3.33 a.m. Studios production. Signing off.